today comes from Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judah, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. When the people of Jerusalem and all Judah were going out to him in all the regions along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, and will gather his wheat into the grain. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is the word of the Lord. And let us go to the Lord in prayer. Precious God, if we hear your word, may we live your word, now and always. Amen. Here we are at the second Sunday in Advent. Advent is a season observed in many Christian churches as a time of expectant waiting and preparation of the Nativity of Jesus at Christmas. The term is a version of a Latin word meaning coming. During Advent, we light the wreath to remind us of this time of hope and peace, joy and love. We prepare our churches and our homes with festive decorations and trees and colorful lights. And we get our hearts ready for the coming of our Lord. And it doesn't matter who you are, where you live, or whether or not you espouse the Christian message. Advent is a time of preparing. In some manner, most people prepare for that special day in December. We decorate our homes, buy loved ones presents, we send Christmas cards, and, and not just Christmas cards, cards with that obligatory letter inside that fills you in on everything that family's been up to for the entire year. We love to see those things. We plan to have family and friends over for a meal, we attend the mandatory office parties, we travel to see family, and we get hopelessly caught up in the frenzy of the season. And for us who live with God, firmly planted in the center of our lives, this list probably captures our holiday spirit pretty well. And we also have the added joy of keeping Jesus in the center of our Christmas holiday. Our time of Advent includes preparing our hearts and our homes and our lives and their very souls for that Christ child. Our scripture reading for today has John the Baptist preparing the way for God's people to encounter Christ. John was a person of great character. In today's society, he would probably be described as a bit eccentric. Here's what John's life was like. His birth was announced by an angel of the Lord. He lived a solitary life out in the desert. His lifestyle was simple, a coat made of camel's hair and a diet that consisted of locusts and honey. I would need a lot of honey for that diet. John baptized and proclaimed that God's chosen one was at hand. And John's life ended when Herodias' daughter asked Herod for the head of John the Baptist to be served to her on a platter. John's life was probably unique compared to Moses. 
but it was an important life because he was called by God to save. His special talent was to prepare people for the coming of God's Son. And John did this in a very particular way. First, he began his message by doling out a threat, a warning, an, an ultimatum, if you will. And here is how Eugene Peterson translates verses 7 through 10 in today's scripture reading. When John realized that a lot of Pharisees and Sadducees were showing up for the baptismal experience because it was becoming the popular thing to do, he exploded. Brood of snakes, he says. Who do you think, who, what do you think you're doing slithering down to the river? Do you think a little water on your snake skins is going to make any difference? It's your life that must change, not your skin. And don't think you can pull rank by claiming Abraham as father. Being a descendant of Abraham is neither here nor there. Descendants of Abraham are a dime a dozen. What counts is your life? Is it green and blossoming? Because if it's dead wood, it goes on the fire. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's from Eugene Peterson's The Message. Better get your act together, John says. If you're not doing good, if you're not following God's ways, if you're not ready to make a change, not ready for your heart to be filled with God's love, not prepared to heed this warning, then a day of reckoning is at hand. The religious leaders of this time believed in God, and that meant that they could quote chapter and verse of Scripture. It meant standing in public and reciting beautiful prayers for all to see and hear. It meant making sure everyone knew how much money they gave to the poor, how wonderful they were when it came to mission work, doing good works to reserve that spot in heaven. The Pharisees would expect to get something from worship. And outwardly, the religious leaders of this time appeared wonderfully pious. They were all about what and who you knew. Unfortunately, they had no clue whatsoever in regards to how to live for God, how to keep God at that center of their lives. And this is what makes Advent, this time of preparing for the Christ child, so vital to our faith. Advent is more than welcoming Jesus into our lives at Christmas time. Advent is our reminder that Christ is and should be the center of our lives all the time. Every day is a day of preparation. Every day we need to make that conscious effort to lay the groundwork, to plan, to invite Christ to be Lord of our lives. We don't need a warning or an ultimatum. We just need to be thankful of what God gives. God gives us scripture, and we know that scripture is an insight into God, something that gives us wisdom and truth. Prayer is not to be on display. Prayer is part of our personal relationship with the living Christ. We live by putting our faith into action in order to help, in order to give comfort, in order to ease suffering. Our mission work is not a checklist, it is an opportunity to demonstrate the love and glory of God. And with God in our hearts, we don't come to church on Sunday to get something out of worship. We come here to give all of who we are and all of what we have to glorify God. As we prepare for the child Christ at Christmas time, as we make every day a time of getting ready for God. And God will bless us because our lives are blossomed. And after John's stern warning, there comes a promise, a way in which we can achieve all in Christ. Again, let's look at Eugene Peterson's translation, beginning at verse 11. I'm baptizing you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. The real action comes next. The main character in this drama, compared to him, I am a mere stagehand. He will ignite the kingdom life within you, a fire within you, changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean house, make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. 
everything falls, he will put out in the trash to be burned. As we live our lives for Christ, we are given several promises. First, we get a Savior that is with us. All that is good and pure within us will be held up before God, and all that is false will be burned away. In other words, if we put our lives, our hearts, our trust in Jesus, He will bring out the very best that is inside of us. The bad is destroyed, the best remains. With Christ, we are also given the promise of the Holy Spirit. Barclay states that the promise of the Spirit is the promise of life. It is the Spirit of God is the Spirit of power. The Spirit of God is true. The Spirit of God brings order. A life without God is a selfish, empty, unfulfilled, not lived up to its full potential kind of existence. A Christ-centered life is a Holy Spirit-filled presence in which we get God's power, control, truth, grace, and peace. John says that we will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Peterson translates this as Jesus will ignite a fire within us. Fire has within it at least three positive traits. Fire eliminates, fire provides warmth, fire purifies. Which means in Christ there is a light that illuminates the way. In Christ there is a warmth that kindles our hearts and points us to that love of God. In Christ there is that sense that sin or evil within us will be purged away, helping us to become pure because God is working together all things for good. The promise of the Spirit is the promise that the fire of Jesus ignites in us and when that happens, it empowers us, each of us, to provide light and warmth and goodness to all whom we meet. Earlier this week, I was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I have joined the Alumni Council Board at the seminary, and I was there for their December meeting. And at the beginning of that service, of that meeting, my friend Joe opened the meeting with this story. I'm assuming the story is true because, you know, internet doesn't lie. So you can take this legend, but it's, it's true right now because it really does make a wonderful point for today. Story about a doctor in the 18th century, mid 1700s. And he noticed a trend in his patients, this, this doctor. He saw a lot of young men, happened to be men at this time in history, a lot of young men who had been out of the country. Most of them had served as mercenaries, had been hired out to fight battles on behalf of foreign places. And he noticed that when they came home, a lot of these mercenaries ended up in his doctor's office. And he noticed a trend. They all had the same symptoms. High fever, irritability, headaches, upset stomachs, depression. And so he did research and he did a diagnosis study and he discovered that he stumbled upon a new disease in the 1750s. A disease that he called nostalgia or homesickness and actually called it a medical condition. That when they were away in foreign shores, people were getting sick because there was a longing to be back home. So the doctor came up with a cure, with a remedy. And the remedy was to go back home again. Not, not home to Sweden from foreign places, to actually go back to your childhood and relive those memories that were so special to you. And if you go back to that place and that house and that town, and you're reliving the memories, all the sadness and longing would go away. That didn't work. And it doesn't work for us because the world is forever changing and evolving and moving forward. And every single person here right now could stand up and give 10 examples of the way things used to be. But I know I'm speaking, so I'm going to give you three examples of the way things used to be. When I was a little boy, nine years old, there was an older kid up the street, a teenager, and he was into rock and roll music, the bad boy. And he had one group that he listened to every single day. 
And as a little impressionable, little impressionable boy, I like that group too. And to this day, I still listen to that group. And I never thought I would ever say the word Aerosmith in a sermon. But there it is. And you know, since the age of about eight or nine, I've listened to my favorite Aerosmith album. On the record player, on the 8-track, on the cassette, on the CD, on my iPod, and now I just push the button on my phone and pull it up on Spotify. The way we listen to and enjoy music has changed. It's evolved. When I was a little boy in the summer, my brothers and I would get up about 8.30 in the morning, and we'd be out the door by 9 o'clock. And we'd ride our bikes, and we'd go to the park, and we'd go to the store, and we'd climb trees, and we'd show up at dinner time. No cell phones, no GPS, no connection with our parents. No way we could do that in today's world. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. When I was little, the churches were full, full of children, full of families, you couldn't get in the door for all the good things and all the love and work that people were doing. But the way we worship, the way we live, times are evolving and changing. And it's okay to think about all these stuff. It's okay to have that nostalgia. Good memories and good times keep us going. And they help us to prepare for Christ and Christmas and every other day in our lives. The caution is always, when we live in the past and we can't accept or we can't move forward to the fact that everything is changing and evolving. The way we play, the way we listen to music, the way we worship, the way we pay bills, the way we shop. Now we shop by sitting at home with a cup of coffee and pushing the Amazon button. The world is forever changing. The world is forever evolving. And and that's a good thing. And there's two things in this world that you can always count on. The first is that that's what the world does. It's always going to evolve and change and move in another direction. We can guarantee that. The second constant is, is that God doesn't change. God is yesterday, today, and tomorrow that wonderful, loving presence in our lives. And that's not going to change. And that's why we prepare our hearts and homes for Christmas. And that's why every single day is an opportunity for us to serve. An opportunity to prepare for Christ, to be blossoming in what we do. An opportunity to bear good fruit. An opportunity that we can wake up every single day and say, Today I am going to do one thing for my God in this world. And I am going to serve Him with all of my heart all of my mind and all of my soul and I am going to prepare myself to serve him now and always. Let us pray. Gracious God be with us. Help us to go out and say. Help us not to worry about what we do but simply to do everything with and for you. In your name we pray. Amen.